Well, this marks the end of the class, and I hope you've enjoyed our time together. There's more to come in future classes where we cover new types of vulnerabilities, and even this class itself will be upgraded over time by just adding new examples. But let's recap some of the key points from this class, shall we? So we learned that this matters because at the end of the day, real people are harmed by vulnerabilities in systems. Whether it's, you know, some family member getting money stolen out of their bank account or whether it's thousands or millions of people losing electricity because the power grid was taken down, these sort of vulnerabilities do cause harm to people. We learned about acid. Acid burns. Acid flows through programs, corrupting everything it touches. And it's your job to neutralize, sanitize, or otherwise stop acid from causing a problem or if you're in a different line of work, it's your job to hack the planet. We learned about all of this different sort of attacker controlled input that can be fed into programs. You know, it's not just the simple things you think of, you know, maybe files or something like that. It's all sorts of things. It's, you know, communicating with a peripheral when you're in the kernel. It's a hyper call when you're a hypervisor. Maybe a debugging interface in some contexts is actually allowing for attacker controlled data that you didn't intend. So basically, you know, again, goes along with programming paranoid, just kind of assume that everything that is fed into a program from the outside is attacker controlled input. We learned about how, you know, you might be in this class because you're a developer trying to secure your software, or you might be here because you want to hunt vulnerabilities. But at the end of the day, this information is exactly the same. And if you're a developer, I'm teaching the vulnerability hunters. If you're a vulnerability hunter, I'm teaching the developers. So it's up to each of you to figure out, you know, how can you do your job the best? We learned about the sploity sense, that supernatural power that some people seem to possess that gives them an intuition about when something's about to go wrong and when there's danger in a code base. But we also learned that there's nothing supernatural about the sploity sense and that at the end of the day, it's just pattern recognition. That's what our brains are supposed to do, We're supposed to recognize patterns. And so if you've seen 100 stack buffer overflows, then it's pretty easy to spot the 101st. We learned about exploit primitives and how an attacker will combine different things like adjacent data overwrites or information disclosure, and they'll put all of these primitive little elements together and subsequently they'll be able to create a full exploit chain. We learned about exploit chains and that's that idea of the different attacker primitives combined together. And the reason we mentioned the exploit chains is just to say that you know, any given little vulnerability might not seem important at the time, might seem like, oh, I don't see how that could matter. That, you know, can't in and of itself allow for exploitability. But leaving around those little bugs just gives an attacker an opportunity to chain them together with other bugs in order to ultimately achieve their goals. And that's why it's very important to close down even the innocuous seeming bugs. Because at the end of the day, exploit engineering is just another type of engineering. It's just a job for some people to sit around every day, you know, at their nine to five job and create an exploit, chaining together these different little pieces of capabilities they get from a bunch of different vulnerabilities. And so, you know, we covered exploits in this class only to give you an intuition that even if you may not understand how a particular vulnerability is exploitable, there are people who it's just their job to understand that. And they just do this very special form of software engineering that is exploit engineering. And, you know, they're going to figure out a way to make it happen. It's their job, right? They only get paid if they do their job well, right? So again, it's always just the best to assume bugs are exploitable and close them down, kill them with extreme prejudice. But a final thought, defense is possible. It might seem like, you know, oh, it's gonna be impossible to close down all the vulnerabilities everywhere. But at the end of the day, nothing ruins an attacker's day like a well-placed sanity check, right? We showed what the sanity checks look like that actually close down vulnerabilities. And in a lot of cases, it's just like a couple line fix, right? So that's easy. Of course, not all sanity checks are created equal. We can have things like the insanity checks where if you don't properly take signedness into account, then you're just going to be, you know, making an attacker do something slightly different in order to still achieve their goals. But, you know, there's other things like tools that exist to help us find vulnerabilities, whether you're a defender or whether you're a hunter, you know, these tools can help you find things faster whether it's fuzzing with or without source code, you know, an attacker doesn't need source code to actually fuzz the code. They can just feed a bunch of random binary data into the thing and consequently find vulnerabilities that way. 
but also things like sanitizers give a defender an edge if they've got the source code and the attackers don't. But for open source projects, then the attackers can just go ahead and compile something with ASAN, run it in a fuzzer, and have the vulnerabilities dump out very easily. And of course, there's also exploit mitigations. And you know, some companies invest in sort of mitigation side of the world extremely deeply, and this has been shown to make exploitation much, much more difficult. On the flip side of things, for those places that don't invest in mitigations, you know, if you're a firmware developer or you're, you know, some custom hypervisor maker or, you know, certain open source projects, if you don't invest in mitigations, at the end of the day, you're just making it cheap to attack you. So as always, let's all remember to program paranoid because it's not paranoia if they really are out to get you. Till next time.